glad that you're here. We have been working this summer through a series uh, in, in the Gospel of Mark called Servant King, basically looking at one chapter a week, and today we are in Mark chapter 9. So if you have your Bible, open to Mark chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have the verses on the screen. If you need a Bible, please uh, stop at uh, our First Impressions desk in the lobby on your way out, and we'll get you a copy of God's Word. So up to this point in Mark's Gospel, we have seen a lot. Jesus has been healing. Uh, he's been telling some awesome stories, calming storms, commissioning his disciples, feeding thousands, walking on water, and as Mark chapter 9 opens, uh, he has just gone up on a mountain with his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he has peeled back the curtain of his own glory and revealed uh, to them uh, who he really was in case they still had any doubts. Uh, the, the, that, that mountaintop moment, the Mount uh, of Transfiguration is a, an incredible, incredible story. But the disciples didn't know still at this time what it was going to cost them to follow Jesus. I know last week we talked about taking up your cross, but that was still fuzzy in the mind of the disciples. Because what we're going to see in, in, in Mark 9 and really for the rest of, uh, of our summer is things begin to pick up steam. The, the things get real. They get difficult because the road from this point in Mark's gospel until the end of Mark's gospel is pointing in one direction. The road is to Jerusalem and the place is the cross. Now I was thinking this week that a lot of us, when we begin to follow Jesus, we're tempted to think that it's the first few years of following him that are the hardest. And in some ways, they, they are, they can be, right? You're learning new things, you're growing in ways you've never really uh, thought that you would be growing before. You're figuring things out, you're getting questions answered. And, and what we believe, or what we're tempted to believe, is that walking with Jesus gets easier over time, Right? It just gets easier. But a lot of us have, along the journey, have realized that the opposite is often true. That it really doesn't get easier. It's, it's usually just about when you, when you start kind of getting into a rhythm of walking with Jesus. Kind of getting your, your mojo, right? Kind of like, hey, I, I've got this thing figured out. It's usually about that time that there becomes some more demands on your spiritual journey that call for more courage, more energy, more faith, more commitment, more dealing with your own sin, and ultimately, and hopefully, more dependence on Jesus, needing to lean on him more and more. And that's what we're going to kind of unpack this morning. We're going to be in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. And as I kind of looked at the, this passage, there are three big themes. We're going to try to tease out each of them uh, just for a few minutes. We're going to talk about demons, doubt, and dependence. I get it. It's, I'm a pastor. I've got to alliterate, right? So we're going to kind of go into kind of three movements in uh, today's passage, talking about demons and doubt and dependence. And inside of this story that we're going to read, one of the characters really does resonate with me. And I think his story will resonate with all of us, because I think we've all been there if we're not in his shoes even this morning. But this is a story that shows us several things. It shows us that, that we are engaged in a very real battle. It reminds us that struggles are a part of life. And most importantly, it shows us how to face those battles and those struggles and, and really where those things are won or lost. So having said that, I'm going to jump into uh, Mark 9, starting in verse 14. And again, the, we're picking up from the place where Jesus comes down off the mountain with Peter, James, and John. Verse 14, Mark says this, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? 
And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. So basically, what's happened, Jesus comes down uh, off the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he observes, he notices that his disciples, the rest, the rest of the disciples, who had been going around town performing miracles, healing people, casting out demons, have come to a bump in the road. They've encountered a situation that they can't control. They're faced with a, a, a demonic spirit, a spirit that they can't seem to figure out what to do to get him out of this boy. And a father walks along. And he's already had the conversation with the disciples. The disciples already try and fail to, to deal with this demonic spirit inside the son. And so the father, when he has the opportunity, looks at Jesus and says, I brought him to you, but your disciples couldn't do anything about it. And, and I can imagine that in this moment, the scribes are loving it. Because they had been arguing with the disciples. Ha, 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 ha. How come you can't do anything about this one, guys? I thought you were more powerful than that. I thought you were better than that. It's like two you know, sports teams trash talking each other. I, that's what I imagine was going on between the disciples and the scribes. And again, the dad, he comes along and, and he's not interested in the argument. He's just worried about his son. And so let me just pause right there. And let's remind ourselves of some things. Hurting people are not interested in our theological arguments. They're just not. And I'm not saying that theology doesn't matter. It absolutely does. But when somebody is hurting, they don't need to be drawn into a debate about theology. They, they just want someone to help them. Our world, our community, our neighbors are not screaming for help with settling every single theological debate known to man. They're, they're not. But many of our neighbors, many in this community, are just screaming out for someone to come and help them. And that's exactly what this father is doing. Let's continue reading. Verse 19. And he, Jesus, answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the, the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, listen to this, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything... Have compassion on us and help us. Again, just put yourself in that, that father's shoes for a minute. But we know this as parents. Nothing will make us more desperate before God than watching our kids hurt or suffer. And as you read that, we can, we can feel the agony. We can feel the pain that the father's heart was carrying Again, what does it say? His son had an evil spirit. And this dad knows that if, if something doesn't change soon, his boy is going to be dead. So he pleads with Jesus. Jesus responds, verse 23. And Jesus said, said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Again, we'll come back to that in a minute. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. Underline that, highlight that, circle that, because we're going to come back to that and spend some time there. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. I, I can't help but think about those two words, but Jesus. 
You know, all of us have had times in our life when there was something we were struggling with. Something was dead or something was about to die, but Jesus, right? Our, our marriage was all but dead, but Jesus. Our, our child maybe is what we, we thought was gone too far, but Jesus. Jesus, we know this, he has a habit of taking things that, that look as good as dead. And, and what does it say? It says that he took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Let me continue. So when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately. Again, this is after the dust had settled. They're sitting down, maybe having a, having a meal or, or, or just hanging out. And they say, why, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So, great story. And, and today, again, I kind of three, three parts to, to today. With demons and doubt and dependence. But I want to show you today, hopefully, that there is strength to be found in your struggle. Anybody with any struggles in your life? Anybody facing any struggles yesterday, today, right? Uh, you're heading to some t- tomorrow, like... We're, we're all there. I, I, I want you to leave, hopefully encouraged, that there truly can and is strength in your struggle. Why? Because it's your struggle that gives you the opportunity to become more dependent on God. And that's a good thing, right? And, and that dependence on God is really where spiritual power comes from in the first place. But we can say it this way. Your struggles are portals to the power of God. That's the bottom line. Your struggles are portals to God's power in your life. So let's go back and look at the story of struggle that can hopefully help us find the kind of strength that we never knew possible. First of all, in this story, where is the struggle coming from? We see it again in verse 17. Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. So, let's talk for a minute or two about demons. And everybody sits up in their chairs, right? Like, let's talk about demons. So basically, and this is a little bit of a broad stroke, but basically when it comes to the conversation or thoughts about demons, there are two camps. One camp believes or lives as though demons are everywhere. Demons are everywhere. I mean, it's why you had a bad day this week. Demons are why you were late to church today. It's why you got a flat tire on your way to work. It's why you flunked the test. It's, it's why anything that, that isn't what you want to happen, that's the story behind it. It was a demon. It was a demon. It was a demon. Some of you right now, you are convinced that, that there is a, there's a demon sitting in the empty seat next to you. Right now. Some of you are convinced they're everywhere that demons are in your boss. Amen? Right? That demons are in your spouse. Don't say amen. Okay? That demons are in your kids. Some of you are like, yeah, I'm really pretty convinced of that one. Right? But you're just convinced that demons are everywhere. You, you get the point, right? On the opposite side of that, there are some who would say, you know, demons are nowhere. Right? They're, they're, we, I don't know why we were having this conversation. We shouldn't worry about it. There, there is no such thing. That demons are just fairy tale stuff made up by religious folks to, to scare them into going to church or to scare them into behaving properly. And again, those are two extremes, but both extremes are extremely wrong. Listen, Mark 9, with the story that we just read, It's not a fairy tale. It's not a fairy tale. This is a real story. And those of you who've been walking with Jesus long enough, you know this, that the Christian life is not a playground. It's better described as a battleground. And the battle that we all engage with every single day, this ongoing battle, is against something that is not simply in this world. It is otherworldly. 
We've, had, we've done messages and series on this before, so we're not going to go too deep into that. But, but we understand that, that the spiritual forces in this world, the evil spiritual forces, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, and all of the demons, all of his angels, have one goal. And that is to destroy the image of God in men and women. And they will do whatever they can to destroy the image of God or to cause us to think less about the image of God in other men and women around us. And I get it. There's some who maybe you're at a faith journey, point in your faith journey where you're still skeptical of the whole idea of supernatural, of the demonic. Uh, you just, the, the, the idea just seems far-fetched to you. And, and, I, and I get it. But, but let me just ask you if that's where you're at. Haven't you felt or don't you feel at times like there is something dark and sinister in this world? Like there's something dark and sinister, something more than just humans being self-centered. That's easy to pinpoint. All the evil, it's, it, 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 we can all trace it back to humans being self-centered, and, and there's a lot of truth in that. But man, it's darker than that because you've seen addiction, devastate a family, maybe, maybe your family. You, you felt, maybe in your own life, a depression that you just can't seem to shake. You, you've heard stories, unfortunately, too many stories of people being hurt and abused, neglected, and, and maybe they're, they're not stories you hear, but they're experiences that you've had personally. When you turn on the news, we all do, and we hear, we hear about violence. We, we hear about dissension. We hear about division. We hear about more violence. And, and at some point, don't we slow down? Don't we slow down and begin to say, what in the world is wrong in the world? I mean, I think we all do. Listen, for Christians... For followers of Jesus, we, we have an answer for evil like that. The, the New Testament is actually insightful because followers of Jesus who follow the scriptures or seek to follow the scriptures, we are able to call evil evil and still love people around us who might be committing that evil. See, the truth is, I think at some point we will either believe in demons or because of all the stuff that we see in the world, we will turn other people into demons. That, that's the choice. And, and again, I, I, think, I think for the Christians, understanding the nature of evil, the root of evil, where it comes from, helps us to look around us and not feel distraught when things around us are, dis are stressing, right? So back to the story. Again, let me just, not everyone is possessed like the little boy in this story, all right? So, so again, I'm not saying that every time something goes wrong, demon possession, that's what the problem is, right? But again, let's go back to this reality that we are all fighting in a world that has fallen, that has principalities and powers always at work in people, in systems, in cultures, in structures. We have to remember that. We are in a battle, but our God is better. We do fight against these principalities and powers, but our God is more powerful. So again, this morning, on a personal level, no matter what you may be going through, no matter what your struggle is, th there is nothing in this world that is too powerful, too strong, too much for Jesus. But, again, back into the story, what if, what, if, what if life gets real difficult? What if it gets really hard? Well, in the story, it got really hard for this dad. Years and years of watching his son suffer. And in this case, it was because of an evil spirit. And over time, that's where doubt begins to creep in. 
See, if, if demons are what we're fighting out there, then often we can say doubt is what we fight in here. Demons outside of us, but doubt comes from within. And so in the passage, Jesus is giving us a master class on the nature of faith. Again, back in the story, the, the disciples say, or the, the father says, that your disciples couldn't cast the demon out. And Jesus responds, how long, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? And he starts off by saying, oh, faithless generation. Oh, faithless generation. Jesus is outwardly lamenting not the lack of power in his disciples, but in their inability to have faith. He's lamenting a lack of faith. Verse 20 through 22. Again, let's go back and read it. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening? And he said again, from childhood. From childhood. And then he says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything. This simple, desperate imperfect prayer, this imperfect request is about to change everything. If you, can have, if, you, if you can have compassion. And he responds, if I can. He says, all things are possible. All things are possible. He's saying to the Father, it's, it's, not, it's not about my ability, it's about your belief. It's not about my ability. Of course I can do something. That's not the issue. The issue is, do you believe? There are no ifs about what God can do. We need to remind ourselves of that. There are no ifs about what God can do. The ifs are on our end. The ifs have to do with our ability to believe. Divine ability is not the problem. Human belief is. Now, when we say that, let me, let me, let me be a little theological with you and tell you what that does not mean and what it does mean, all right? Just so there's no, um, no confusion. What does what I just say not mean? Um, some think that, well, if you just believe enough and pray enough and have enough faith, then you can have whatever you want. It doesn't mean that. That's not what Jesus means. It also doesn't mean that just because you're sick or in need of something, and something is, or something is wrong in your life that, that you just don't have enough faith, that you're not praying enough, that you're not religious enough. It doesn't mean that either. Of course, Jesus is not saying that. What is Jesus trying to get at? I, I think what he's trying to get at is he's trying to describe what true faith means and what true faith looks like. And here's how I would say it. It's gonna be up on the screen. Take a look. See, when it comes to faith... What's important is not the strength of your faith, but rather the strength of the object of your faith. The object of your faith is way more important than your faith. See, again, Jesus isn't giving us, and again, there are, there are churches and pastors who read this passage as though there's some kind of cheat code to getting what we want from God. Th this passage doesn't give us a, a cheat code. God is not a cosmic vending machine that if we just know what buttons to push, we can get the answers that we want from him. What Mark is doing here is he's showing us that no power resides in us to do anything of spiritual value apart from leaning on Christ, depending on Christ. The power is in him. And the way that we access this, the way that we access this is through prayer. We'll see that another in, in, in a minute. But again, here, here's something else in this passage that I think is great about Jesus when it comes to our doubts. He helps us even if our faith is wavering. He helps us even if our faith is flawed. That's what we see in verse 24, which to me is such a powerful, powerful statement. 
when the father says this, I believe, help my unbelief. Can anybody, does anybody, you know, identify with the father there? Right? I believe, help my unbelief. <clears throat> this, ma- this, this man's prayer, this dad's prayer, let's call it what it is. It's a mixture of doubt and trust, which maybe this is not true of you, but it's true of me, has marked my life an awful lot. I trust Jesus, but there's some doubt mingled in often. I I believe that God can and will, but I let doubt seep into my heart far too often. But in this story, Jesus doesn't rebuke the father for his measure of doubt. He rebukes the demon and tells the demon to get out. I think about it. Jesus doesn't say to the father, well, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go home and I need you to deal with your doubt first. I need you to get rid of your doubt. I need you to purify your heart. I need you to spend the next 48 hours in prayer. I need you to memorize some more scriptures. I need you to go all in or I need you to go away. Jesus doesn't say that. Then once your doubts are all gone, come talk to me. That's not what he does. Because that's not who he is. The father, in essence, is making this confession to Jesus. He's saying to Jesus, you know what? I'm not as faithful as I should be. I have, I've got a ton of doubt. And Jesus, I've got to be honest with you, I am falling insanely short spiritually. I'm not where I need to be. Jesus, quite, quite, quite frankly, my, my faith feels pretty weak right now. It's incomplete at best. It's partial. It's frail. But even with all of that, I believe. I, I still trust you. He's saying, Jesus, help my son despite me. That's honest. And I think that's where a lot of us live a lot of times in our faith journey. And here's the good news. We've read the story already. Jesus responds to that kind of prayer. He responds And I hope as we see this story this morning that you are encouraged. Listen, no belief is perfect. Nobody's belief is completely pure. You might be in a situation where you would describe your faith as being weak. It may need some help. You might need some brothers, some sisters, some friends to to prop you up. But just like this father, you can plead to Jesus for mercy. And for his power. By simply being honest. Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. And the good news is that Jesus is the kind of Savior who, who will take our small, flawed, mustard seed faith And he's the one who moves mountains with it. And that's good news. That's encouraging. Again, so we're we're fighting this this spiritual battle against these forces. We we have flawed faith, but we're we're still going to lean in and plead for, for Christ to help us. What, what else? What now? And that leads us to, to this kind of third movement in this passage. And it takes us back to the disciples. It has to do with this word dependence. Dependence. Specifically, and we see it in the story, dependence evidenced by a fervency in prayer. Again, the rest of the story. The boy comes to Jesus. Disciples couldn't do anything. Jesus says, bring the boy to me, has the conversation with the father. He casts the demon out of the boy. Everybody is excited. This crowd goes home. 
Jesus and the disciples go, you know, pull apart for a little bit. They're having this debrief moment. And let me read verse 28 and 29 again. It says, when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And again, I, I don't know all of the details of this, but here's, here's my thought this morning. See, up until this point, up until this moment, the disciples had been doing just fine casting out demons. Jesus sent them out. Their, their demon casting out ministry was going great. They were seeing results. They were putting up big numbers. But for some reason, in this moment, this encounter with this demonic spirit, they were powerless. So the, the logical question is, Jesus, what happened? What happened? Why, why, didn't it, why didn't it work this time, Jesus? And his answer? You didn't pray about it. You didn't pray about it. Well, well, Jesus, I mean, we've been doing this for a while now. I mean, we've got it down. We know what to say. We know, you know, we know, we know the deal. Like, we've gotten really good at this. Yeah, but Jesus would say, you didn't pray. But Jesus, come on now. We know what we're doing at this point in the game. Jesus, is, is that really necessary? The prayer part? And Jesus would have said, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is because your lack of prayer means something. It means that you've gotten prideful. You've begun relying on yourself for the power to cast out the demons, and the power was never in you in the first place. So when you come up to this situation thinking that you've got this down pat, you're tempted, and they clearly did believe that they didn't need to rest on, depend on, lean on Christ and his power in that moment. And what he's telling them is, don't confuse the power with the source of the power. Don't confuse the power with its source. Don't confuse your ability to do something with depending on the one who actually enables you to get it done in the first place. Again, if we're writing it down, you can, you can say it this way. The disciples were powerless because they were prayerless. Their quote-unquote ministry success caused them to become careless in their own spiritual walk. And the first thing that left them when the pride started to set in was prayer. Which again, what is prayer? Prayer is a lot of things, but it, it's a, among many things, it's a declaration of dependence. God, I can't do this. I need you to show up. If you don't show up, I'm sunk. If you don't move in this situation, Nothing's going to happen. God, I can't do anything on my own. And that's not what the disciples did in that moment. Uh, they were relying on their own skills, their own techniques, their own strength, their own experiences, their past successes. But it was never about any of those things. It was about the object of their faith, who they were putting their faith in. They forgot that spiritual ability Spiritual power comes through dependence and prayer. Which the good news, and here's the good news, is available to us. It's available to us when we pray. When we fall on our faces, when we lift up our hands, when we, when we cry out with our voices to the God who is able to do anything. So this morning, church... Zion, family, that's why I said at the beginning that your strength is in your struggle. But there's a, there's a little asterisk there. Your strength is in your struggle if your struggle leads you to depend on God. 
if it leads you to cry out to him, if it leads you to be fervent in prayer. Because historically, isn't it those things, the struggles, the hardships, the difficulty, don't those things tend to lead us to be more desperate? Again, we don't need more discipline to pray continuously. We need more desperation. I'm not anti-discipline. Have your prayer time. Circle it on your calendar. Be consistent with that. You need those regular rhythms. But you know what I'd like to see out of me? It's just more desperation. Pleading, begging, recognizing that unless God does it, it's not going to happen. Unless God moves, nothing will move. So, so what do we do with all that? Well, I think that our desperation in prayer or, or lack of it is probably the best indicator of where we're placing our trust. So let me ask you, based on that, where are you placing your trust? When was the last time that your prayers could be described as being desperate? So you, you, you may not be dealing, hopefully, you may not be dealing with a, a, a demon-possessed child like this dad in the story. But right now, if I know you, and I, and I know a lot of you, and I, and I know many of you, I know some of the struggles that you're facing in life. They're, they're varied. Your, your struggle might be a, a struggle at home. Your marriage is struggling, if you're being honest. Are you desperately crying out to God? You might be struggling with your kids. That might be where your struggle is. Are you crying out? Are you desperate? Or are you just saying, well, I'm just going to fix this on my own. I'm going to read another book, right? Listen to another podcast. I'll fix this. Or are you desperate? Your spiritual struggle might be a little different. It might be might be something in your heart. might be something in your head. Maybe your spiritual struggle has to do with that inner voice that keeps saying to you, you're not good enough. You, you are not really forgiven. God doesn't love you. you. Your struggle is the fact that you continue to believe the lies of Satan. That's a struggle. They can only be dealt with. They can only be overcome with desperation. Desperation in prayer. Your struggle, and this is way, way too often, I think we're honest, you know, when we talk about demons and demonia, and demon possession and demon whatever, I, one of my, my go-to um, statements is, um, I do a pretty good job of screwing up my own life. My flesh messes things up pretty good that sometimes I think the devil looks at me and is like, Pfft, we don't need to harass that guy. He, he does a good job. And so, again, if we're just being honest, sometimes our struggle is just, it's just our own flesh, our own greed, our own envy, our own desire for power, our own lust, our, our own drive for money, our, our, our own drive to just work ourselves to death. And, and maybe that's the struggle. You, you, you recognize, I've got a struggle that's going on inside of me, and it just has to do with my own flesh. Again, whatever the struggle is, you can find strength in that, growth in that, if you lean hard, depend on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the source of power in our lives. So, as a worship team comes, Whatever the struggle is, whatever lessons to, to glean from the story of this father who was desperate for Jesus to show up, bring it to him. Even if there are elements of doubt, even if you would come and kneel and pray in desperation and just say, Jesus, right now, I believe, but I've got some doubts, but I'm bringing both of them to you because I know that I need to give them to you. I need to depend on you with the struggle that's going on in my life. And if you're here today and you're not yet following Jesus, you've not yet 
believed the gospel, put your faith in him alone, his death, his burial, his resurrection is to me all the evidence that we need, that when we take whatever it is that we're dealing with and we put it on him, we give it to him, he's able to do more than we can ever imagine. And if today you recognize that you need to start a relationship with Christ and you're not sure how to do that while we're responding in just a minute, come and tap me on the shoulder, pull me aside after church and say, hey, how do I begin a relationship with Christ? So here's my challenge to you. Do you believe that Jesus can help you with your struggle? If the answer is yes, then I I invite you to come and just pray. To to come and kneel and pray as a a declaration of like, I'm I'm confessing to you, Jesus, that I I, I want to depend on you. I've got some doubts, but I still believe. Just come and just, just pray with somebody. Pray by yourself. Pray with your neighbor. Pray with your spouse. Tap a friend on the shoulder. If you come down and just want to pray about it, somebody will will come and pray with you. But let's spend a few minutes responding to what God is teaching us in these last few moments. Father, we love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for opportunities to, to, again, lean in, listen, learn, grow. And I pray that all those things have happened this morning, not because of my words, but because your word is so powerful and your spirit is able to to do more um, than than we ever could in, in our own humanity. Use this time to to draw us closer to you, and we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Let's stand, let's sing, let's pray, let's respond as the Spirit is calling us.